The Weather Lounge podcast is brought to you by Crew Tracker Software. This is the Weather Lounge here at Weatherworks. Hi there, everyone, and thanks for dropping by the Weather Lounge. I'm your host, meteorologist Brad Miller, and our latest podcast comes to you from our Weatherworks headquarters located in Hackettstown, New Jersey, and made possible by Crew Tracker Software. And joining me, as always, here in the Weather Lounge is my good friend and co-host, meteorologist Mike Mahalik. Hey there, Mike. Hey, Brad. Good to be here once again. Um, got a nice uh, podcast coming up here today with uh, one of our clients. Yeah, yeah. He is. Uh, we do have a guest on the show today. And yes, as he said, he's a client of ours here at Weatherworks. Yeah, his name is uh, Jake Shivo, uh, and he is with JSP Companies in Massachusetts, and he recently went to Buffalo um, during that historic lake effect snow event. Um, so <laughs> did, did he go there because he likes the snow? Yeah, <laughs> I think he was going to help out. Um, but either way, I, I think it was it will be a really interesting conversation to talk with somebody who was in the thick of things like we saw it from <laughs> from far away but he was right underneath it and i tell you i had the pleasure of, of meeting jake uh this past summer uh june of 2022 out in milwaukee during sima and a great guy um this is going to be a this is gonna be a fun uh, fun podcast and very interesting one like you said i i, I just want to hear about you know being on the front line right there with all that uh, heavy lake effect snow yeah, and we're going to get right to that. We'll talk a little bit um, about how the lake effect snow actually works. We'll talk about Jake's experience uh, in this historic lake effect storm, talk about amounts and everything that went into it. But we'll do that right after the break. So stay with us. Since 2004, Crew Tracker Software has enabled snow and ice management companies to save time, money, and resources with their comprehensive digital services platform. All the information needed to plan your operations and make business decisions is current and always available. Along with QuickBooks, Crew Tracker Software provides seamless integration with Weatherworks certified SoFall totals. Visit CrewTracker.com to rock your game and learn how Crew Tracker Software makes managing snow and ice simple. Take advantage of the SIMA Show Special $500 discount and White Glove Startup Service Offer. All right, and welcome back to the Weather Lounge, everyone. I'm meteorologist Brad Miller, and uh, once again, we have uh, Jake Shivo with us today, and he is with JSP Companies uh, located in Massachusetts. Now, Jake uh, went out to the Lake Effect, the historic Lake Effect uh, snow event we had near Buffalo just uh, this past November, and uh, Jake, uh, welcome to the Weather Lounge, and uh, we're really uh, anxious to hear about your experience out there with, uh, you know, what, 70 to 80 inches of snow. Yes, sir. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on the show, Brad and Mike. It's uh, good to speak with you guys again. Um, Jake, why don't you give us a, a quick little background of uh, your company and uh, you know what you guys do um, uh, across the region? So JSP is an exterior service firm. We provide snow and uh, commercial landscape services, um, as well as uh, we're a manager of commercial real estate and. New England and um, and further during emergencies like this event that happened in Buffalo. Great, that's that's awesome. So I gotta I gotta preface this uh, conversation a little bit, Jake, um, because uh, you know you're one of our Storm Alert clients and you called in for consultation, and I gotta say I was a little bit taken back by <laughs> why does Jake want to know about Buffalo? Um, because you know, you're, you're more concerned in Massachusetts area. So, um, I, I was a little bit floored by, uh, you talk, you took me off guard a little bit, um, with that question, but you know, we did discuss and, and we did talk about, you know, what's going to happen out there. Um, so yeah, man, Jake, what went on with that decision? We have a, uh, an extended network of, of uh, you know, customers and, <clears throat> and, and colleagues um, that we knew were going to need our help. Um, we, were at, we were asked by some folks to, to come help them out uh, during this event. But, uh, you know, more than anything, we, we knew that the, that the Buffalo region was going to need some additional help to, uh, to battle this storm. Um, you know, more, more importantly, the, 
we went out to Buffalo eight years ago and there was another, uh, it was actually to the day, uh, a big Lake effect band. It, it, um, November 17th or November 18th. Oh, so you were out there for the one in 2014 also. I'm talking about the one in 2014. Oh, we, wow. we, worked out, we worked out there prior and, you know, people were dying because of their lack of preparation or they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, people would get off the highway because because the interstate was closed and they were routed to a to a secondary highway uh, that was, you know, roads that were unplowed and, and people were people were trapped in their cars when, you know, 50 to 70 inches fell and, they, and, the, and the road crews couldn't get out because they fell behind. Um, so, you know, we, we, we take snow emergency work very seriously when, uh, when events like this happen. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that's certainly, you know, we saw pictures out of the most recent event too, uh, where people were getting stranded and there's not much you can do when you have snow falling, you know, at rates of two to four plus inch an hour, uh, <laughs> type of stuff going on. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, what, what, if you fall behind and it's, it's coming down that fast, it's just, you can't catch up at that point. Unfortunately, it's just, uh, it's impossible. So in, you know, in, in one instance, um, I want to talk about, you know, the, the gradient and the localization of these, of how these, some of these bands set up, you know, if you were in, um, if you were right in the bullseye of the storm, it was snowing three to six inches an hour. If you were, you know, miles, I, I mean like two to three miles just outside of the band, the, uh, you know, the sun, the sun could be out. And like there were, the people were at, people were at uh, Niagara Falls, and the sun was out, and there was blue skies, and and just just south of Buffalo, around like the Cheektowaga area, just the, those those towns that are that are just south of the city. I mean, it was hammering three to six inches of snow an hour. Yeah, and I did. I did look back at that, Jake, too, and, and you're absolutely right. I, I took a look at our certified snowfall totals product, and we have radar that we look at through there, and I measured the um, the width of the band uh, coming off of Lake Erie, and it was anywhere between 15 to 20 miles at most was how wide that band was. So if you weren't in it, I mean, it just wasn't snowing that much at all that's and, that wasn't your that wasn't your world it was just it was just another day if you were going about your <laughs> business and and um you know miles to yourself i mean you could if you if you got routed into if, if you got routed into a, an area where there was a band you know you could get in, in trouble really fast um we were on our way to uh, to do a site assessment and um it seemed like every every two or three roads that it w- was shut down. It was, it, it was impassable. And we were trying to get it. We were trying to get back to our hotel and we went, we went down a road. Uh, it was, a, you know, it was a secondary highway somewhere, somewhere off of the, uh, somewhere off of the interstate. And we got to a, we got to an alternate road because our GPS wouldn't let us go down uh, the turn that we had, that we were driving towards um, in one instance, there was, uh, uh, one of the roads, there were probably 15 tractor trailers just idling on the side of the road in the middle of the road, cars that had tried to make their way around the trucks. And, and even on, on that pass, we were, we were blocked. We couldn't get past the trucks. We went maybe two or three miles down one road and, uh, you know, to be, to be stopped. And then we, we had to back, we had to back up about two miles. When we backed up, we came up on a, on a four door sed- rear wheel drive sedan. And the, a, as we approached him, the guy got out of his car and he said, I'm stuck. I can't move. And coming at us was emergency lights. And, you know, we, we start helping, we're helping the guy dig his car out so we could get him turned around so we could turn around. And then there's a, an ambulance and a, uh, rescue vehicles came up and, and all of a sudden we had like six or eight uh, first responders with shovels helping dig the car out. Now they're on their way to a call. 
they have somebody that they had somebody up the road that's got heart trouble and and and, and we're trying to dig a car out that's 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 stuck and i mean these weren't people that were ex- expecting the you know this to happen these were people that were on that were on the throughway and they were forced to get off you know i guess that said something about you know if you are well if you have any idea if you're traveling you might run into adverse weather to have something in your car to kind of help you out if you do get into a crazy situation like that absolutely you know the relying on the alerts to to, to pop up on your phone just isn't just isn't enough you really <laughs> if you're driving out if you're driving out out, out there in, in in that you know in that and on those conditions um you should be checking the you should be checking the radar so you know when the when the band is setting up because you know the bands of those storms can 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 shift oh yeah in in in, in short time as, as you guys know sure I mean, in this instance, um, the band itself, the the heaviest band coming off of Lake Erie, uh, pretty much just was stationary for almost two days. Um, From the 17th to the 19th, it kind of wavered around the area, pretty much aimed at Orchard Park, Hamburg, um, you know, those areas just south of Buffalo. Um, From the 17th to the 19th, um, from what we saw, there was 77 inches, and then another four inches or more that happened the following day. So they ended up with over 81 inches of snow in this area where Jake was at. Um, downtown Buffalo had about 24 to 27 inches. So still a lot of snow for sure, but we're talking about only 9 to 10 miles to the north. I think I read somewhere like where the Bills play, the Buffalo Bills. I mean, we saw pictures of the stadium. I mean, I don't know how much they got, three, four feet, maybe 77 inches at the stadium. Yeah. The stadium's in Orchard Park. Right. And now if you go to the north side of the city uh, where the University of Buffalo plays football in their stadium, I think they got like maybe six or seven, eight inches, and that's it. And I I think that was when that band finally shifted north for a little bit and then came back down south. But that, like you said, Mike, that's, that's a huge difference between south Buffalo and the north side of Buffalo. Yeah, the, the the gradient for for how fast the the storm drops off is absolutely staggering. Right, and and you know it's just the amount of snow. I can't even comprehend <laughs> that amount of snow in nor'easters on the east coast. When you're talking about an I ninety five from from Boston down to Philadelphia, if you get a big giant nor'easter, you might top out around thirty inches of snow out of that thing. Now when that happens, it's just like amazing the amount of snow there is. Um, but we're talking about at least twice that amount, and in some cases even more, um, which I, I don't even know how to picture that <laughs> in my head. I mean, it, it's got to be staggering or, or almost like you're being uh, uh, buried uh, out there uh, up in Buffalo. We were at one location just absolutely buried. We were in the process of removing, um, I believe it was like, we, I, I think we estimated it was about 65 inches of snow at the site that, that we were, we had a, we, um, you know, that we were currently working at. And that band that you just talked about that went, that was supposed to go to the North it shifted south again. So where we were working that already had 60 plus inches of snow, that was the night that they got another, another, you know, 20, you know, better part of two feet of snow fell. Um, you know, we were, the, the, the location that we were at was directly across the street from Lake Erie and Hamburg. And it was, we had, we went from clear skies to, uh, all hell broke loose and the snow was whipping in sideways across the lake. Uh, the only thing that I could make out was that there were strobe lights on the, on the, on the snow melter. I could make out the, I could make out those strobe lights, but I couldn't see more than 20 feet, 20 to 30 feet. I, I I'd say it was probably the most intense snow band I've, I've, I've ever worked in. And that's saying something because, I mean, you know, Jake, being uh, from Massachusetts, I, I know you've been in some pretty major nor'easters before. 
was this like deja vu of 2014? Was it basically the same kind of setup and I mean, same places almost? It was the same kind of setup and it was the same, it was the same intensity as well. Yeah. I mean, I know the national weather service at the Buffalo office recorded five inches an hour at one point. Um, they said the visibility was down to a few hundred feet um, max. I, I would argue that, that it was considerably less. I mean, de- you know, depending on where you are, if, if you're, if you're miles, if you're, if you're just, if you're north of where the, you know, the bullseye of that storm sets up, it's going to be one visibility. But if you were like smack dab in the, in the center, um, I'd say six at, at one point, you're, you're right. Six inches uh, of snow was, was definitely falling in an hour. Uh, yeah, I mean, the most that I've ever seen, and, and Brad, I know you, I've said this to you before, was four inches an hour um, for two hours, and that was in one of the East Coast blizzards that we had, I think, back in 2016, and I thought that was incredible. Um, so we're talking about one or two more inches per hour. like And for 12 more hours, 12 to 24 <laughs> yeah. more hours. <laughs> and, and not for a two-hour period. Right. We're talking about a day's worth. Uh, and I forget, I, I feel like I I, I did a, a quick math in my head. There was a 24-hour total of 60-some-odd uh, inches in one of the towns. And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, like, that is about three inches an hour for, for 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is uh, pretty crazy, uh, if you ask me. We're only human. It's <laughs> physically impossible to 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 move that much snow at once because you you can't see. You know, un- until our until our uh, our snow plowing robots come in next year, we're we're gonna have a hard time keeping up with that capacity. So tell us, Jake, um, how did you deal with this intense snowfall? How did your team handle it? Yeah, what did you do with it is the bigger <laughs> question. Yeah, uh, how did you try to keep up with this situation that was obviously probably about as extreme as you get? I mean, you just have to you have to stay on top of it. You can't you can't stop. You can't get behind. But you have to you have to stay on top of it while you know, while ensuring that everybody stays safe and everybody stays rested and that everybody, everybody eats. So, um, it's, it was all about, you know, uh, putting together a a rest plan and alternating everybody's shift so that we weren't going too hard for, for too long. Fair. Is there a certain amount of rest period you try to get for your workers out there in the field? I mean, we try to give them a good. We try to give them a good night's sleep, um, four to six hours, six to eight hours. That's more than I can remember. Uh, back when I was, um, I used to work uh, for a landscaping company, and and I did some plowing work in the past. And I remember not getting those breaks and working uh, twenty four plus straight hours. And uh, I got to tell you, it wears on you, <laughs> and I'm sure you know, Jake. Also, BK. Before kids, so yeah, true. Absolutely, <laughs> used to get more well, sleep than that. We've got we've got small kids, and that you know, thanks to thanks to the grandparents, um, you know, we were able we were able to work this storm. Now, now you had mentioned that you did have a hotel. I mean, that was going to be my next question, and I was wondering that before we even talked with you before the the, the podcast, and and I mean. I mean, you couldn't stay in your trucks. I mean, you needed to get good rest and food. So, I mean, was uh, ho- the hotels? I guess had to stay open. Uh, had they staffed these things? Yeah, the hotels. The hotels stayed open. Yeah. I, again, the the bands are the bands are narrow. That's true. We, Once you get out of the band, I guess. It's, yeah, but that that's probably the hard part is how to get out of the band. <laughs> right. So the um, we 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 stayed. We stayed just north of, just north of where the heaviest band uh, set up. Um, so we we kind of got we kind of got lucky that uh, where where we were where we were staying didn't didn't get as much snow as where we were working. But again, we're you know we're we're talking like four or five miles away from where we were working, and they re- they really weren't affected that as where we were working. Yeah, that's just amazing. Now. I wanted to go through a little bit about 
um, for our listeners at least, how this lake effect develops. Um, Because this isn't a typical um, regular low pressure system, Brad, um, that develops. Um, You know, this is basically fueled by the lake itself and the warm temperatures of the lake and the heat coming off of it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, lake effect snow, I mean, November and December are usually the busiest months when it comes to lake effect snow, because like you said, the, the water is still the warmest coming off the summer and fall. And you get these Arctic air and these blasts of cold air to go over that warm lake water. Um, that's what produces uh, the, the snow. I mean, it's, 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 it's what we look at as a meteorologist, cold air on top of warm air is unstable. So it allows for, you know, um, condensation and all that kind of stuff and you know moving upwards in the atmosphere and condensing into liquid which is turns into snow because it's so cold but you know it's just the the basic dynamics of of how you know weather works and uh, you know we see the same thing and jake may even uh may even have uh something to say about this is get ocean effect snow every once in a while even in new england uh with the way that cape cod kind of sticks out and you get colder air over the warmer ocean water still, but not to this degree, of course. Lake effect easily, you know, uh, trumps uh, any kind of uh, ocean effect snow. But you know, you get these setups, and you get the bands just right, and they're moving across that water. Um, you know, it's just a perfect, perfect parallel band to the water, and that's where you get the uh, the heaviest snow. Right. With with ocean effect versus lake effect, it's it's typically squalls or uh, you know accumulations of you know not more than a couple of inches at at best typically um can you think of any can either of you think of any events where we we got uh we got big ocean effect snow like this no there's not been events of ocean effect in massachusetts that's really been a lot more than you know that that three inch four inch type range um and i think there might have been one event not long ago where there there could have been six or seven eight inches something like that um where it was a bit more persistent but the reason why that does happen is the fact that when you get ocean effects snow, you get multiple bands coming off the ocean um so it kind of looks like um fingers of snow coming off the ocean which might only be which might only be five or 10 miles wide. So when you have an individual fingers of snow coming off the ocean, not, not one of them can get so strong to produce those incredible rates of snow that you see off of um, the great lakes. So the reason why you do get single bands um, coming off lakes Erie and Lake Ontario, that occurs when you have the wind direction going parallel uh, along the lake surface. So in the case of Buffalo, you had a west-southwest cold wind going across that entire stretch of Lake Erie. And that forms one solitary band. You get convergence uh, of winds right, right in the middle of the lake, which intends forces everything upwards. And then that all pushes to the north, uh, east-northeast, you know, just into Buffalo or south of Buffalo. And what also, as Brad mentioned, helps is that you're taking all of that water vapor off the lake, you're lifting it through that process. And there's also a little bit of elevation as you get out of the Great Lakes. So that lifts that moisture up across the terrain and that, you know, produces condensation, produces the snow. Um, that just gets so heavy. And when it consolidates into one solitary band like that over a long fetch that's Never ending band 500 almost. miles, <laughs> um, that's what creates such intense, heavy snow. And in some cases, I, I know there was um, uh, thunder and lightning um with that lake effect band i don't know if you saw that jake out there yeah that was my next question for jake did you see thunder or did you see lightning hear some thunder yes we did there was <laughs> there was definitely some thunder snow going on the um the, the the night that we rolled into town um we we got into town just as it was start it was, as it was starting to to come down 
heavily and to our north, uh, you know, the sky was pink and you could see, you could see booms of, you could see booms of light in the, you know, off to the distance. Yeah. That first initial band that came off the lake was really intense. I remember seeing a lot of things on Twitter of, uh, numerous, uh, thunder snow reports, um, going on during that event. Um, I'm happy you got out there. You're pretty scary to drive in it. <laughs> I bet. I mean, I I personally have not experienced thunder snow. I've had it sleeting before and it and getting some lightning, um, but not thunder snow, which is surprising. I, with all the uh, big northeast blizzards and nor'easters, I, I seem to have missed out on it um, throughout the years, um, which is saying a lot. I'm like, yeah, I thought you would have had thunder snow somewhere in your life. No, I just have not. And it's one of those phenomena that I have not experienced firsthand. You know, you could just kind of lump that in with a tornado. I haven't (laughs) seen a tornado uh, firsthand, which is a little bit more uh, rare if you're not going to go chase the things down. Um, So, (laughs) um, but uh, yeah, it's just amazing. It just shows you the intensity of of that lake effect ban. I mean, anytime you have... Uh, whether it's lake effect or a nor'easter with an intense rate of snow that's intense enough to produce lightning um, in that situation. It, it, I mean, that's about as strong as you can get. Can you define convergence relative to uh, lake effect and ocean effect? What's the simplest way that you, how you would, how you would define convergence? Yeah, so what I'm saying, when I say convergence, what I'm meaning is that winds are uh, coming at each other. Um, Kind of if you can picture winds coming out of the east, winds coming out of the west uh, at the surface, and then they hit each other like this in the middle, and then they start rising. Well, they're forced upward, yeah. Yeah, they can't go down because you have the uh, ground surface there. So when they converge or meet each other from opposite directions, they have no place to go but up. Um, so that's kind of what happens um, in these situations. That's what causes these. That's what causes. That's what's causing the loud, the large clouds to form. Right. So you get that vertical motion that gets stronger and stronger, and it's like a it's a constant feedback process, uh, especially in the lake effect situation where you have the winds coming on either side of the lakes. So they converge you know, in the middle. Parcels of air forced upward. They'll, they'll go upward as far as they can go until they yeah. actually are forced to condense and then they'll fall as either liquid or snow. In this case, it's snow, obviously. The reason I wanted you to to define convergence is because it's not a weather term that, that you hear every day. Sure. Especially if you, especially if you're not in a, especially if you're not in a heavy snow uh, region. Right. And that's kind of, if you want to think of it a different way, it's sort of what happens when you have a cold front moving in too. Um, same sort of idea where you have winds that are uh, coming out of the northwest running into winds that are coming out of the south. Um, so they kind of hit each other and meet and they force that cold front forces it upward along with the colder air behind it, which is cutting underneath the warm air out ahead of a cold front. So that basically forces the warm air up because um, when we think about it, cold air is much denser um, than warm air is. So the cold air will always undercut that warm air and force it to lift up. And when you take warm air and force it up and cool it down, it's just like a Coke bottle when it, when it's, when it's cold, it starts condensing on the outside. It condenses on little particles in the air, creates that precipitation. um, And that's the process that goes on in all types of weather situations with cold fronts and storms and warm fronts and things like that. So hopefully that clarifies your, uh, uh, question a little bit there, uh, Jake. It does. Yeah. I know that, 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 uh, rivers, uh, in, in, in New York are also, a, are also affected The can't the, uh, the storms can make their way up into the, into the Hudson Valley. Yeah. I mean, the thing with, um, rivers and river valleys that we really watch is that, um, usually when you have a valley like that, there's potential if you have high pressure to the north of that valley, you could get some cold air damming is what it's called. And what basically happens is is that the cold air gets kind of funneled into those lower valleys. 
um, and it can't get routed out very quickly. Um, it's stuck. Even though warm air is coming in uh, all around the area, the cold air is dense, so it settles closer to the ground, and it doesn't want to get out of there too quickly unless you force it out of there with a lot of warm wind, and it's hard to get that into those valleys. Usually you're stuck with a north wind, um, and that's what you've probably experienced, Jake, uh, many of the time. Yeah, I'm going to say in Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah with uh, freezing rain events um, where northern Massachusetts is kind of just stuck because, you know, that that cold air keeps funneling down from New Hampshire where it could be snowing. And it just kind of doesn't doesn't route out very easily because you're a little too far away from the ocean. Freezing rain, that's one of our biggest challenges. In- yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think it is for everybody. Ice is the worst. I mean, you can you can forecast till you're blue in the face how much ice somebody's going to get, and and you know it's just hard to pinpoint. You know, because it only takes a little bit, and I I know you know that, Jake. That uh, you know you get just a just a thinnest of layers of ice on pavement or surfaces. It's mm-hmm. a nightmare. You have to you have to plow it up and constantly salt it. Um, when that happens, you're, you know, we're, we're plowing water off, off of parking lots, salting after it. Sometimes we'll, we'll put anywhere from eight, we could put eight to 10 applications down in the middle of an ice storm. By the time you, by the time you get done, it's, it's iced over again. Yeah. That's the trouble of freezing rain. I mean, that's pretty much the only way you can battle it is just keep salting it, keep salting it, but it always kind of, as it continues to rain, it gets diluted. The salt gets diluted on the pavements and then you start getting the freeze up again and then you got to salt it again and then it dilutes and then you got to salt it. And it's, uh, I know you guys out there in the snow and ice industry just hate when freezing rain is in the forecast (laughs) because you're just burning through materials, right? Absolutely. So what would you say would be the easiest this is kind of off the wall question, but the easiest event for you to deal with in the winter time, Jake, what, what would you say? Uh, storms that we only have to, that we have to push once at the end of the event. Okay. That's, that's probably the easiest events that are under, you know, three inches, three inches and under. And then when does it start getting more difficult? Where's that threshold where you start saying, okay, I'm going to need to get some more equipment in here. I'm going to need to get some trucks, some loaders, things like that. Well, it's, 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 it's usually, it's, it's usually we need, uh, uh, it's usually the salt. Mm. Uh, When the, when the ice storms happen is when it it can get difficult. We have, uh, you know, we have plenty of capacity and, and, and we have backup for the events when, you know, we get into these heavy, when we get into these heavy events. But I, I would say, I would say when we get into ice storms is when it is when it gets the most stressful. Uh, I'd say that and uh, the lo- the longer duration storms where we get more than a, a foot of snow. However, after, you know, after working in, uh, you know, working in the Buffalo markets, I come back here <laughs> and I, I say, really? Three inches of snow? That, that's it? Like, <laughs> I just dealt with 83 inches. Yeah. Probably puts things into perspective a little bit more um, yeah, when, when, when you think about it. Um, uh, luckily, um, getting uh, 70 to 80 inches of snow in Massachusetts is is not a thing. <laughs> um, maybe for the of, season. Yeah, maybe for the season, that's fine. <laughs> for the season, for sure. Um, but uh, getting that out of a couple of days worth of snow um, is pretty unprecedented. That doesn't really happen. If it did, I I think we'd have a lot of Massachusetts clients, uh, <laughs> losing their mind after a few days. <laughs> so I guess Jake, that whole time we were out there too, I'm, I'm sure you were, you, your eyes were stuck on the radar and, and could you, did you notice the little maybe shifts every once in a while where you could maybe attack one area versus another? And I mean, yeah, there were, there were, there were shifts. Um, and it had to be so, so, had, so subtle, but I mean, I guess it, it would make the difference though, between, you know, maybe one inch an hour versus hitting the four or five inches an hour. Right. And it was, uh, you know, the, the best thing we did was, was stay in contact with, with, with Mike. And I, I remember a couple instances, Mike, I, I checked my email and then, uh, I, uh, you were, you were checking in to see how things were going out there. <laughs> That's and, great. And I'm sure that everyone in the office was as well, you know, 
Um, we really rely on, uh, on Weatherworks to, um, you know, to, to help us stay informed. And um, I just want to want to thank you guys for all of your, uh, all of your help, you know, with this last event, as well as over the years, you guys have, or uh, you guys, we really consider you guys an asset. Great. I really appreciate that. Uh, Jay. Yeah, we appreciate yeah. it. We, we take every meteorologist at Weatherworks takes pride in their fork and they take them personally too, you know, cause everyone knows there's, there's always going to be something that goes wrong and you try to forecast as good as you can, but they're relying on a, on a good forecast and they're, they're basing their, their, their business and their, and um, you know, their, their plan and scheduling uh, is, is all around that. Right. Well, you can't, you can't do a perfect job, but you can also, but you can always do an excellent job. And that's, all that, that's all that we that we ask is that you know is that you give it 110 percent you know whether it's whether it's you guys in the office or it's our you know it's our teams out in the field yep and 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 i i second what brad said 100 percent. we we are always trying to give 110 percent on on what we think is going to happen and, and it might not always pan out perfectly but um the best thing that we can do is communicate communicate to you guys our clients what we're seeing, what the changes are, so that you guys can adjust your operations as fast as possible. So that's what we really kind of pride ourselves on here. Absolutely. But um, yeah, I mean, great discussion here, uh, Jake. Um, one thing that we didn't really touch on yet is um, the snow melting machine that you've mentioned in the past. I, I know that you've talked to one of our meteorologists, uh, Aaron. Uh, here at Weatherworks about it, talked to me about it a few times, but um, explain a little bit about, you know, what it is. I mean, just a big machine that melts snow. I mean, what goes into it? So w- within our group, we have, we have different size snow melters that we can, we can deploy to a, you know, to a site, to a region, you know, et cetera. Um, think of it as a big hot tub. You dump the, you, you bring, uh, you have to bring water up to you have to bring water up to temperature so it has a heating element, and once the water is up to up to temperature, uh, you dump the snow into a large hopper, and um, there's a circulation pump, and it it pumps it, it pumps and it dumps the water onto the snow as you as you dump it into the into the hopper. Um, the snow when it comes out of, it comes out of the melter, when it comes out of the melter, it has been, it's been through a series of screens and the snow is discharged as a, as a clean water. Um, the contaminants that would otherwise, you know, be in the snow are trapped in, in the, in the, uh, in the filtration of the, of the machine. So, um, it's a it's a cleaner approach. It's a greener approach, believe it or not. Um, and for when you have when you have large volumes of snow, there's not enough trucks to move the snow out fast enough. So we'll bring in we'll bring in a melter, and we can melt our machines on a smaller scale can melt anywhere from three to four hundred cubic yards of snow in an hour, and Larger units um, can melt anywhere from six to nine hundred cubic yards of, of snow in an hour. That's that's amazing. I, I mean, I didn't realize that it goes through that filtration process, but I guess that's very important considering the the products and, and the salt and the in the mag or whatever you might use might get mixed up with that, and even pollutants from the pavement itself. So it, it's great that it actually filters that out. Um, you, you you're never you're never gonna filter out the you're never gonna filter out the chloride, but you are gonna f- filter out the harmful carcinogens that are in you know sand and 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 road debris that's that's in that lot that gets pushed into that pile. So you can you can separate out all of the any trash any contaminants that are on a you know that that are within the grounds of a site. Uh, a lot of leaves, debris, packaging material builds up. The the paint striping that's in a parking lot. Um, now, when it gets trucked off the site, it's it's probably going to it's it's probably going into uh, out, out there. It's probably going into the harbor or into miscellaneous snowfields. Um, 
they have a lot, you know, there's a, there's a lot to get, there's a lot to get rid of. Um, so that's, we're, we're, a, you know, we're a big advocate of, of, of melting. You know, we, we provide the service in new England and, uh, for larger events, we, you know, we're available to, you know, to work in other, in other regions. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I did see pictures out in Buffalo where they had <laughs> bulldozers, you know, big cat like uh, bulldozers pushing this thing up into a, a hill of snow. Um, Absolutely, anything that anything that can move snow is typically used in an event like this. There were excavate there were excavators uh, in uh, in the city of Buffalo. They were loading they were loading dump trucks downtown Buffalo with, with small excavators, um, not the most efficient approach, but, um, they had a lot of work to get done. So every piece, every piece counts, right? All, all hands on deck, right? Uh, when you have something like that. Um, and I think the, uh, Buffalo bills made a good decision on switching that game to Detroit. Uh, <laughs> because I get into the airport though. Yeah. Out of their I, homes. I, I saw the pictures on, on, on Twitter of, um, uh, the Buffalo, uh, the stadium there was just entirely filled with snow. And that's the one thing I was surprised. Like we didn't think about our players. Come on. <laughs> They're getting snowed in. Um, let's, yeah, let's go are coming to, to dig them out so they can get out and get to the airport to get to Detroit. <laughs> C- can you magically physically removing 77 inches from the inside of a, of a large stadium like that? I, I don't, really no i mean obviously <laughs> just keep filling up uh triaxles i suppose uh until you can't do it anymore i i, I don't know how they would physically remove all that snow uh out of in between all the seats and the aisles um they would bring a snow they'd bring they'd, they'd back a small snow melter right onto the field and, and melt it right into the drainage system oh there you go I, but I, I, I do believe that that is how they cleared the Bills Stadium. Okay. During that event, I've seen before in the past where they've set up like snow slides, almost like a plastic. Yeah, like a Green Bay. I've seen that at Lambeau. Yeah. And they and they have people shoveling the seats and stuff into these plastic slides that you know slides right down to the field, and then they handle it from there. But um, pretty amazing stuff. Um, you know, Jake, I mean, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I don't know if um, you have anything to add, but I think we pretty much covered this historic event from how it developed to how much snow fell to how we dealt with it or how you dealt with it, I should say. Yeah, don't be taking credit for that, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I won't. I think we've touched on all, all points. I just, you know, I, I wanted to say that, uh, you know, the lake effect snow, it's it's no joke and it's potential must be respected because you can get into trouble if you're not prepared. Well, Jake, I really do appreciate you coming on the podcast. It's been really great talking with you and, um, you know, I'm sure we'll be talking much more throughout the winter here. Um, as we deal with, uh, storms, uh, entering new England here. Um, so it, it'll be a good time. And, and I, again, thanks for uh, being on the show. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Brad, Mike, for your time and, and inviting us. It was uh, it was an honor to be here talking with you guys on the show, um, and to you know all the listeners out there and fellow snow people. Happy holidays and, uh, and happy New Year again, Jake Shivo with JSP Companies. All right. Thanks a lot, Jake, for being with us. And that is it for. Our podcast about lake effect snow. So thanks for joining us. Remember, we'll have a new episode every two weeks here on the Weather Lounge. So stop on by and listen to those episodes. And don't be afraid to rate our podcast. Rating it pushes it higher and allows more eyes to get on it. So we really would appreciate that for sure. And uh, remember, we're WeatherWorks. You can visit us at weatherworksinc.com. And you can find WeatherWorks on basically any social media platform that's out there. So thanks a lot, everybody, and thanks for listening.